we're good to go. All right, so if I'm correct, looking at the agenda, I am tasked with the lovely um, job of inviting everybody to this event. So my name is Felicia and I am the current board president of the United Nations Association Marin County chapter. Um, if for those of you who may not have heard of the United Nations Association before, we're a, a network of, I think, around 200, 200 plus chapters throughout the United States that promote the work of the United Nations. And most recently that includes the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so today in our, our every other month series, we have sustainable development goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to PJ. Hi there, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm PJ Navi. I'm, uh, I'm a member of the board at UNA Marin. Uh, I'm 18, so I'm pretty young, but I'm still excited to discuss these important issues with you guys. Um, I guess um, just a quick overview of what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to have, it's going to be a three-part event. Um, we're going to have a great presentation from our wonderful president Felicia about the the global and international perspective and of SDG number seven, which is is Marin leading the way to clean energy and, and broadly as a clean energy goal. Um, and then as well, we're gonna have Sebastian Kahn from Marin Clean Energy uh, speaking today and giving a wonderful presentation about locally and how it, how it applies to us. And then we are gonna have a group discussion. Um, after every single presentation, after both presentations, we're gonna have uh, group questions. So if possible, please think of some great questions while our speakers are giving their presentations. That would be fantastic. Um, Okie dokie, I think I'm going to pass it off now to Felicia to give her presentation. Great, thanks PJ. So I'm going to share my screen and sometimes it's a little tricky because I'm using two monitors, but I think I can get this going. All right, uh, so can somebody confirm that you can see the big yellow cube you are up great thanks all right so this is a brief introduction to united nations sustainable development goal number seven affordable and clean energy so the phrase affordable and clean energy as you see on the cube here is the shortened version of the longer title which is ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And I am advancing the slides magically. Here we go. So as you may know, under each sustainable development goal, there is a set of targets. And I'm just gonna briefly read 7.1 through 7.3, just these slightly larger text ones here. By 2030, ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services. 7.2 by 2030, increase substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. And 7.3 by 2030, double the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. So as we go through this data, what we're thinking about is where are we at? Are we actually able to get to this uh, in this time frame of by 2030? So this is a 2019 um, report. And in here they say, according to the latest data, the world is making progress toward achieving Sustainable Development Goal 7, but will fall short of meeting the target by 2030 at the current rate of ambition. So we're moving in the right direction, but we're projected as of this uh, report to fall short. And we're going to look at a little bit more detail about what that um, looks like. So with regard to affordable and clean energy, we'll start by looking at affordable, meaning who has access to energy in the world currently. This uh, sort of spectrograph, this color graph of the countries shows us that 
obviously Africa is the continent that has the least um, access to electricity. So again, this is just about electricity period, not where the electricity is derived from. And then of course you can see throughout the rest of the world, there's these little pockets that don't necessarily have access to 100% of people don't necessarily have access to energy electricity on an ongoing basis. Also, and this is from our world and data. And we do know that in the United States, just anecdotally, not 100% every last person has access to electricity. Sometimes people don't pay their bill or some people are homeless. And so therefore they don't have access to electricity for sure. But statistically speaking, as far as our world and data is concerned, uh, this is how they shape up the, the global picture of access to electricity. So this is a, a little detail from this 2019 report. And we'll look at these two columns. 2010, 1.2 billion people were without electricity access. And by 2017, they said that number had gone down to 840 million people without access um, to electricity. 2010, 2.96 billion people were without clean cooking. And by 2017, that number had gone down only slightly to 2.9 billion people without clean cooking. And the last one we'll look at is from 2010, 16.6% total final energy consumption from renewables, that number had increased just slightly by 2017 to 17.5% total final energy consumption from renewables. We're gonna skip that last one. And then just to give you a sense of the energy use intensity globally per person, just a quick glance tells you that um, the Middle East and uh, nor North America here are places with the highest um, energy use per person. And just a, a picture here of global fossil fuel consumption shows that some, since approximately 1950, gas, oil, and coal consumption has dramatically exponentially increased. And again, this is from our world and data. So now if we look to clean uh, portion of affordable and clean energy, this is electricity production by source globally. We see up here that coal is apparently the most popular. <laughs> followed by gas, hydropower, nuclear, wind, oil, solar, and other renewables. Just kind of interesting to note here that uh, somewhere around maybe 2017, wind surpassed oil, but this is just with regard to electricity production, not necessarily all forms of energy. Um, so then here, this picture shows us, as the title says, electricity production from fossil fuels, nuclear and renewables world. And we can see that renewables as of 2020 from our world and data, 28.97% of the overall um, electricity production consumption picture. And if you watch carefully, I'm just gonna toggle forward to the United States. And you can see that renewables for the United States as of 2020 was 20.44%. So that's the world, that's the United States. This confusing picture here, I apologize for that, just want to point out briefly, they show on the left installed renewable capacity in gigawatt hours. Um, so China is first in terms of installed renewable capacity. This is as of 2017, with the United States second, uh, as we can see in those the lineup of countries listed along the bottom. And on the right, installed renewable capacity per person as of 2017. And there we can see the United States is number 11. So we're gonna look at just a few interactions between SDG seven and a few of the other SDGs. So here, if we look at SDG seven and number 12, responsible consumption and production, this is an article from wired.com where it says, solar panels are starting to die, leaving behind toxic trash. Photovoltaic panels are a boon for clean energy, but are tricky to recycle. As the oldest ones expire, get ready for a solar, uh, a solar e-waste glut. So that means if you happen to be in the market for solar panels, it's wise to question your installer about the manufacturing protocols of the solar panels, whether they are disassemblable and the materials recoverable, either for recycling um, or ideally something like reuse or even upcycling. And then here we say, this is a, um, an article from a, a miscellaneous website I found, and I, don't, I have not vetted 
the veracity of the claim in great depth. So if anybody else wants to, feel free to get back to me. But what they claim here is that a cheeseburger has the same emissions as about a half a gallon of gasoline. So that's setting number seven, affordable and clean energy next to climate action, number 13, 15, life on land, and three, good health and well-being. And that is all for the slideshow portion, but I now want to actually share with you a short video. It's about, um, I think, five minutes that I did with a friend of mine who is based in Abuja, Nigeria. And I just have to bring it up and make sure that you are able to hear the sound. So I'm going to reshare my screen including the sound. So somebody just let me know if you are unable to hear the sound once I get this going. OK, we, we call it the Make Her Space project. and. Uh, the high is emphasized because um, what we seek to achieve is to build the capacity of girls uh, and reorientate them on the need for them to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and uh, mathematics. So we, we actually call it STEAM because of the arts that is uh, between the, the engineering and the mathematics. And um, what we are doing is having this girl go through a series of, uh, uh, of technological builds, very simple builds that would serve as an inspiration for them to want to pursue careers in STEAM. And um, the, the focus is getting um, low income uh, girls to participate in the program and helping them to understand that technology is for both genders. It's not uh, a male thingy. Yes, because we, we need, um, as the way the world is going, we need uh, to diversify in that particular sector. And uh, if we must even hone on um, achieving sustainable development goals, I think we need both genders on uh, every goal that that's the, that the SDG has, has been crafted to, to achieve, yeah. I agree, so us, I agree. Yeah, that's, that is the drive for us. And so what does an actual workshop look like with the cell phone charger uh, program? Okay, so from our end, we provide these girls with um, uh, what we call the charging module, um, batteries, and also we provide them with a voltage regulator. The, these are just basic components, as well as the solar panel, which is five volts. We also teach them how to uh, create or build uh, power banks. So uh, the power banks also utilizes a charging module, which the solar uh, USB solar charger can also power it, like you can charge the batteries of the power bank, um, the girls or whoever can get to use it uh, at a much later time. Yeah. So at the end of the workshop, what do they take home? The first thing they take home is their confidence, the confidence to, um, to pursue careers in STEAM. The second is an opportunity to be able to solve common household pro uh, problems using technology. You understand in this part of the world, uh, electricity is epileptic. Uh, I think that's even one of the reasons why we have to have this conversation now, uh, while, it's still, while we still have the light of the sun. Um, so for these girls to be able to have access to light in the night when they need to read their books, We've taught them to be able to also build a, a rechargeable light, um, as well as uh, this, these are still things that are interconnected with the earlier build, which is the solar powered USB charger and the, and the power bank. So with these builds, the girls can be able to solve little challenges um, that they encounter within their communities. And um, so far, so good. Uh, 
permit me to just share that we've had success stories. Some of these girls are, are already beginning to um, fix one or two components within uh, within their homes, from burnt out sockets to uh, electrical extension wires, and even fixing the big time conventional power banks when they are damaged. Yeah, so I think that for us is uh, a big takeaway. The girls are motivated to really pursue technological uh, studies. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Glad to hear that. I would be lost if I had to repair a power bank. <laughs> <laughs> so far, we've been able to train uh, over, I think, a little bit over 600 girls um, from April this year to August 31st. And we are hoping to make that number 1,553 at the end of July next year. So that is our target. And uh, uh, we are available to have conversations on how it's going anytime, any day. Great. And if somebody wanted to learn more about it or make a donation or see photos of the projects, then can they find you? Is it Would, be, would Facebook be the place to look or oh, your website? Oh, yes, both Facebook and our website, but I think um, we've leveraged more on the use of Facebook because of the kind of community we interact with. Um, and our Facebook uh, name is just facebook.com slash Yishda Nigeria, which is Y-I-S-H-D-A Nigeria, all together. Yeah. Super. Well, thank you, Moses. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, great. So that was the global look at SDG number seven. And I believe if I'm correct, PJ, we now go to questions. Yes, everyone, please give a little round of applause for Felicia's oh, really? presentation. <laughs> wow, what a great perspective from Moses. I, uh, I'll have to agree with you, Felicia. I would also not be able to repair a power bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, well, everybody, it's question time for wonderful Felicia. Um, as I said, I hope you guys came up with some great questions. Okay. If anybody has any questions, feel free to just blurt them out. Like you know, Sue's got a, her hand up. Thank you. Um, great presentation. Um, extraordinarily well done. One of the issues um, constantly being faced with is the political will to make uh, sure that these uh, it, these things, these changes, the development of the SDGs and the achievement of them, the political will is missing. And I'm wondering if there's any brainstorming or any ideas that anyone might consider now or in the future to help us get America, since we are in America, to help us get this, this momentum going so that we can actually contribute in a much better way. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, and I'd be curious if anybody else has some thoughts on that. For me, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. And, you know, you have to ask what, what drives political will? Well, it's economics, <laughs> because the people with the money are able to buy the influence. Um, and so unless and until either the economics change, uh, which is, we've been hoping, you know, that that would happen, but that's so slow or uh, the purpose of the system changes um, from economic, from the growth of profit and the growth of control essentially to something more like uh, the growth of human well-being uh, and, and ecological well-being. Um, and, and then we'd of course have to back that up with, with the economic piece in terms of where we put our money. So, so Sue, for example, um, we'll, we'll mention at the end that there's an upcoming event United Nations Association Western Region is putting on uh, October 1st with regard to um, global climate change. And I've been participating in some of those meetings. And one of the things that come up for me is that a lot of people are not really hyper cognizant of the economic piece that drives global climate change. Or if we're talking about number seven, affordable and clean energy, you know, like Moses, who, who I just interviewed in that little video there, he lives in Nigeria. And, um, you know, 
every country probably on earth has a certain amount of corruption. Nigeria is probably one of, I, I believe it's been documented to be one of the more corrupt governments. And what does that really mean in practice? Well, it means that that influence of money into what we then see as political will, um, that, that uh, corrupting influence of money is particularly strong and of special interest groups. And, and in the case of Nigeria, the majority of their economy is fossil fuel dependent. Um, so for me, that's, that's the big thing. And of course, we don't have time to really unpack that today, but top of mind thoughts in any case. If I can just continue that a little bit with you, Felicia, and maybe others. Um, We've started, because we are a capitalist country and we have contributed to the attitude of capitalism throughout the world. People want what we have and it takes, you know, there's a price to be paid, many prices. Um, Hazel Henderson, who you may be familiar with, has initiated a program many years ago that many organizations, some here in Marin and in Northern California and in the world, have uh, adopted, which is the um, triple bottom line. And perhaps we could work in creating a, a, um, a team or a collaboration with some of the um, people in, in the UN or in, in and working on the SDGs uh, specifically about using this triple bottom line, how to create uh, well value for your stockholders, but also to create value for your community and your company and to contribute to society and elevate the environment. And it's, it has taken off, but it's very slow because uh, most people hesitate to make change, even though that's probably the only thing we can really count on. And it, uh, but because now is a very transformative time, it might be worthy to um, either UNA Marin or collaborate with the uh, Western region or somehow create a team that can maybe take some of the essence of, of this project or any other project and bring it to some of the you know, the big spenders and have them help them see the benefit that they can create. I'm just thinking out loud because this to me is, is a big problem getting it, getting it to happen. And I, again, just interested in brainstorming, but I just wanted to take the next step. And again, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Sue. And if you don't mind, if it's easy to, if you have any URLs for Hazel, um, and what she's up to, that would be great to share in the chat. And if anybody else has relevant resources as well. Um, so you might have heard of the triple bottom line, um, everyone else. There, there's also ESG, environment, society, and governance screens um, for different financial organizations. I would encourage you to um, look for big banks, which big banks are um, unfortunately financing continued fossil fuel industry expansion and exploration and take your money out of those banks and put them in smaller local banks or other banks with a more uh, aggressive sustainability and social uh, focus. Anybody else have questions? Fortunately, we are running out of time for our questions, but feel free to circle back when we go to our group discussion in a little bit. Um, I think it's time to introduce Mr. Khan, Sebastian Khan, I have a quick bio to read out for him really quickly. Uh, Sebastian Khan serves as community development manager as part of MCE's public affairs team. In this role, Sebastian is responsible for partnering with local government staff in Marin and Solano counties on energy efficiency, energy resiliency, and sustainability initiatives in support, in, in support of MCE's mission of addressing climate change by reducing energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. Most recently, Sebastian served as the key community and local government point of contact for MCE's expansion and efforts in Solano County. Sebastian has five years of professional experience in the energy and utilities field, having served in a similar capacity with PG&E prior to joining MCE. Previously, Sebastian worked for the Golden, Gates, Golden State Warriors, where he established grassroots community relationships that supported the development of the Warriors San Francisco Arena at the Chase Center. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Sebastian, and I'm looking forward to hearing his fantastic presentation. 
Great. Thanks so much, PJ. And thanks for the great presentation there, Felicia. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, folks. Oh, um, PJ and Paul, I'm getting a message saying that the host has disabled participants. You can now share your screen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's try it now. The power of being a host, you see. All right. There you go. You're sure. Y'all see that? Okay. See yeah. All right. And can you see my notes? So can you still just see the presentation? Just the presentation. Okay, great. Well, Paul, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, again, PJ, thanks for the introduction. Um, again, folks, my name is Sebastian Kahn. I serve as Community Development Manager with MCE. Um, here today to discuss the role that community choice aggregation programs like MCE um, are playing in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You know, I think we got a really great introduction to kind of the global perspective from Felicia's presentation. Um, but I'm here today to talk about um, at a state level here in California and really a, a hyper local level here in the Bay Area, um, how we're reducing GHGs and also want to hit on kind of the individual uh, tangible climate action measures that, that you all can take. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, goes without saying, climate change is one of the biggest threats facing us today. Uh, from an increase in the number of extreme weather events to dramatic health impacts, climate change is about more than things getting hotter. Uh, over the past decade, we've seen the impacts of climate change in our communities, and whether that's the extreme heat storms that hit us seemingly each summer now with, you know, multiple days of 100 degree weather, or the increased number and expanded reach of devastating wildfires in our communities. Uh, these impacts can be dangerous for many of us, and we need to make every effort that we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and combat climate change. Now, chances are you've probably heard the term greenhouse gas emissions, but not everyone knows exactly what that means. So uh, for the purpose of framing the discussion today, the Environmental Protection Agency defines greenhouse gas emissions simply as gases that trap heat in the atmosphere. Now, looking at some statistics from the EPA, the US is actually the second largest producer of greenhouse gas emissions. And as Felicia alluded to in her presentation, there's been a major increase in GHG emissions in the US and around the world over the last several decades. So looking at the pie chart here on the left-hand side, in 2018, over half of the emissions produced in the United States were from transportation and electricity alone. And probably needless to say, but reducing or eliminating these emissions from these sectors would have a major impact on our country's carbon footprint. The good news is that here in California, we've been working really diligently since the 1990s to reduce our emissions. Now you'll notice that transportation now actually represents the largest portion of our emissions. Uh, and California has been working tirelessly to encourage the adoption of clean transportation, electric vehicles, uh, fleet electrification, so on and so forth. But what I really wanna focus on for the purposes of today's presentation is that electricity, which represents about 27% of nationwide emissions is only 15% in California, which is great news. And that's due in large part to agencies like MCE, Community Choice Aggregation Programs, uh, offering renewable energy services to our customers and dramatically reducing the carbon footprint of our electric grid. So what is community choice? Uh, diving in, just to set the stage a little bit here, in 2002, there was state level legislation passed through Assembly Bill 117 that allowed agencies like MCE to exist. Um, this legislation essentially allowed for communities, that's cities and counties, to pull together and aggregate the electrical load of residents and businesses within their community. So instead of an investor owned utility like PGE purchasing power for communities, AB 117 allowed for cities and counties to purchase that power themselves. Uh, at the highest level, CCAs like MCE, uh, and I do wanna call out, I saw some folks from Davis and Sonoma on the call as well, some great CCAs in your neighborhood, uh, Valley Clean Energy and Sonoma Clean Power. Um, these types of agencies are public, not-for-profit agencies that purchase renewable electricity on behalf of their customers. Uh, CCAs follow a customer opt-out model so folks are automatically enrolled, um, which helps support the state's clean energy goals. Now, this slide is meant to break things down a bit, you know, kind of how the CCA model works and how that electric service ultimately comes to the customer. 
So as you may know, all electric customers pay generation and delivery services. Generation is how the power is created and delivery is how that power um, then travels over the grid to customers' homes and businesses. So with a CCA program like MCE, um, MCE takes over PG&E's role of electric generation for customers, supplying more energy from clean renewable power sources. Now PG&E continues to deliver the electricity from the grid to your home or business, um, address service outages, maintain the poles and wires, things of that sort. But the end result is that customers now get a choice of where their generation of power is coming from. Um, and really the beauty of it too is that there's no service or infrastructure upgrades that the customer needs to make. Uh, the only thing that's changing is the source of the power where it's being generated. So community choice aggregation is not specific to the Bay Area or even California. CCAs do exist in nine states across the country and that's designated in the green states here. There are, also, there are several other states that have introduced legislation that would allow for CCAs to exist. Uh, those are the blue states. And a few states in the orange, our friends in the Pacific Northwest, uh, are in the early process of considering CCAs. Now, as far as the state of California goes, MCE was the first community choice program. Uh, we launched and began serving customers here in Marin County in 2010. And while we were the first CCA, we're certainly not the last. Um, due in large part to our success as an agency, the model has grown around the state over the last decade. And there's now 24 active CCAs across the state of California. Um, hundreds of participating local governments and over 10 million customers served through community choice aggregation. So here's just a, visual, a, visual, a visualization of where CCAs are located in California. And I do wanna call out um, San Diego Community Power actually launched earlier this year. So this map is a little bit out of date. You can imagine um, that lower right hand portion of the map is now green and serving customers, which is great. So where does the power come from um, with the CCA model and with MCE? Uh, the short answer is mostly renewable sources. We know that fossil fuels are the largest source of US air pollution, but renewables on the other hand are pollution free and come from constantly replenishing natural resources like solar and wind. And so by turning to these sources and limiting our use of fossil fuels, we can help create a clean, secure energy future for California. And that's what we're doing at MCE. Um, as you can see in the middle here, our standard service is 60% renewable. Roughly 20% of that figure is from solar generation uh, and 29% is wind, uh, mainly from California sources and also throughout the Pacific Northwest. On the right-hand side here, you'll, hear, you'll see a service called Deep Green. And that's actually our 100% renewable option. Uh, comes from 50% wind and 50% solar sources, all based in California. Um, that is an opt-up option. You know, it does cost about five dollars more a month, but you are getting that 100% renewable portfolio. Um, and on the left, you can see that PG&E's standard service is 31% renewable. So with MCE, you're getting nearly twice the renewable content. And you may be wondering what are kind of the cumulative effects of having such a high percentage of renewable power in our portfolio. Um, since 2010, uh, through our energy procurement practices at MCE, uh, we estimate that we've eliminated nearly 500,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I thought it was important to call out that yes, MCE is making a tangible impact on GHG emissions, but perhaps more importantly, the CCA model at large is making a significant impact in the state of California uh, with regard to increasing the amount of overall renewable energy statewide. And this has been validated by a number of research institutions, including the Leskin Center for Innovation at UCLA, as well as the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I think I skipped a slide there. Oh, no, just kidding. Um, and, you know, really one of the great things about community choice aggregation is the ability to invest in local renewable energy projects. So at MCE, we have what's called a feed-in tariff program or FIT, as you'll see on the, um, on the graphic here. Basically what this is, is a wholesale renewable energy purchase program that allows developers of small scale local renewable energy projects to become long-term suppliers for MCE customers. Uh, the way that it works is that a project owner or developer would enter into a contract with MCE. Uh, they would then interconnect to PG&E's grid and MCE would pay 
them for the energy generated by the projects over the course of a 20 year contract term. And as you can see by the map here, we actually have several of these projects in Marin, uh, some of which include the San Rafael Airport and the Cost Plus in Green Bay, which both have rooftop solar that are um, you know, generating power for MCE customers, which is really great. Um, just talking a little bit about the state, you know, since MCE's inception, more than uh, $1.75 billion has been committed by MCE and our project partners to develop and construct California renewable energy projects. And through this process, we've supported um, about 5,000 California construction jobs um, with more than 1.4 million labor hours created. So really hitting on that workforce development piece as well. Um, and showing that the, the demand for California renewable power, um, you know, and, and other CCA programs have created through their policies. Um, so this is an innovative program that we're really proud of as well. Um, we've, we've really taken the steps to support pollinator friendly solar. Um, basically what this means is that any new solar project um, that partners with MCE is required to plant pollinator friendly ground cover throughout the project site. Um, and these projects provide much needed habitat and diverse food sources for critical pollinators like bees and butterflies. Um, and this is important because scientists predict that utility scale solar will expand to almost 2 million acres by 2030. And so with pollinator friendly solar, we're optimizing this land and tackling two problems at once, uh, pollinator health and climate change. So I, I talked a little bit about our 100% renewable deep green product earlier, and I wanted to call out um, really some of the great climate leadership that our local government partners are showing. 70% um, of our member communities across MCE service area, that's Marin, Napa, Solano, and Contra Costa counties have chosen to opt up their accounts to deep green. So that means that um, municipal accounts like a city hall, a public works building, things of that sort that a city or county would own have opted up to deep green. And so yes, in Marin, uh, all cities and counties have opted up their accounts to deep green, which is really great. Um, now that you have some background about CCAs and some of the work that we do, I wanna talk about ways that you all can take climate action. Um, and there's really three things that I wanna hit on. The first of which is to check to see if you are a CCA customer. The second of which is if you are a CCA customer, um, I'd hope you'd consider opting up to 100% renewable. And then, um, you know, a number of CCAs don't only offer a great energy product, but also offer several key customer programs that folks can take advantage of. So I would um, say folks should consider purchasing an electric vehicle, um, investing in solar plus storage, and also home energy efficiency measures. So one thing you can do to, uh, to check to see if you're a CCA customer is simply by looking at your bill. Uh, so your utility bill each month will still come from pg e but you'll notice, um, so this bill right here is a pg e customer, but you'll notice that with MCE service, you'll actually see a line item that says MCE electric generation charges. Um, you still pay pg e each month for the costs associated with the delivery of your electricity, but the key difference is now the electric generation comes from MCE. So that's a really easy way to see if you're an MCE customer. Um, and same thing if you're in Davis or Sonoma, uh, you would have a generation charge from your respective CCA. Uh, additionally, for about one penny per kilowatt hour, um, and in layman's terms, that's about $5 more a month for the average residential customer you can consider opting up to deep green. Again, that's the 100% renewable, 50% uh, solar and 50% wind product. And it's, it's really easy to do. So all you need to do is go to mceoptup.org. Uh, you fill in your name, email address and phone number, uh, tap the authorization box and hit submit. And then MCE will take care of the opting up on the back end for you. Um, just a quick example of the cost comparisons, you'll see some of the different costs for residential customers. The top line is the electric generation rate. Um, and as you can see, the generation rate for our standard light green service, as well as our 100% renewable deep green is significantly less than standard pg e service. The next line is actually the delivery, which all customers pay, regardless of who their generation provider is. Um, one item that you do pay as a CCA customer is an added PG&E fee called the PCIA. Um, 
it's the it's that's known as the power charge and difference adjustment. Um, all CCA customers pay this, and it essentially exists to help compensate PG&E for energy contracts that they entered into on your behalf before you were a CCA customer. Um, but ultimately, we know the most important uh, thing that customers pay attention to is that bottom line. And you can see here that the total electric bill cost between MCE standard service on the far left and PG&E's on the far right is uh, very close in, in cost. You know, MCE ends up being about 45 cents more expensive for the average residential customer, but you know, pretty much at parity with PG&E. Um, so making sure that you're a CCA customer and opting up to 100% renewable are some of the easiest things you can do. But let's say you wanna take that next step towards climate action. Um, I think one of the uh, important things that you can do is consider uh, investing in electric vehicles. Um, on the EV front, we know that one of the major barriers to folks purchasing an electric vehicle is worrying about where they're going to charge it. And so that's why at MCE, we actually offer up to $3,500 per charging port for workplace and multifamily properties. And in Marin, that can be coupled with the transportation authority of Marin's rebates. So it ends up virtually paying for um, charging stations at multifamily and workplace uh, places. And also we do offer a $3,500 rebate to income qualified customers that wanna purchase an electric vehicle. And one thing I also wanna mention is battery storage. You know, one of the new technologies that you're likely hearing about. Uh, we do offer a battery storage program at MCE, both for residential customers, as well as commercial and industrial customers. And there's a, a, a few key benefits to battery storage. Um, the first is that the battery actually performs what's called peak load management, where it charges from the solar that you have on site uh, in the daytime when energy prices are the least expensive. And it goes through a process called discharging um, when energy is more expensive between 4 to 9 p.m. and also the dirtiest on the grid. So you're using that battery to power your own facility with your on-site solar. Um, the battery is also charged to full capacity in the event uh, that a PS, PS event is called. So a lot of our customers see the real benefit from a resiliency standpoint. You know, they want to keep power on during power shutoffs and batteries help enable that. And last, batteries actually begin charging and prioritizing essential electricity requirements in the event of an unplanned emergency outage. And last but not least, on the home energy side, we know that heating, cooling, and water heating account really for more than half of most folks' home energy needs. And uh, MCE and a number of our other um, CCA partners uh, can help you save money and energy while making your home more comfortable. Um, you know, we do offer what's called a free gift box with energy saving products like LED efficient light bulbs, uh, things of that sort, and offer a virtual home energy assessment to help you save on your bill each month as well. And for commercial customers, we also offer rebates and no cost energy efficiency assessments as well. So I would say that energy efficiency is also one of the ways that um, you can consider taking climate action. And that is it for my presentation today. Happy to answer any questions. And again, thank you all so much for having me. It's, it's always great to connect with community advocates that care about these issues so much. So thank you. A tremendous presentation. Quick round of applause. Sebastian. Thank you Thank so you, much. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing some of the notes in the chat here that I missed while I was presenting, but Paul, thank you for, for knocking those out for me. Uh, I had a quick My question pleasure. as we'll move into the uh, Q&A part of this. Um, you'll have to remind me, super simple question, what is the specific law that introduced uh, CCAs to California? That's uh, called Assembly Bill 117, PJ. Yeah, that was in Thank 2002. You. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, anybody else can just blurt out. No, no need to raise a hand. I have sort of a practical question. So, um, Sebastian, you said that um, does MCE, if I asked if they could come over and do an assessment, because I don't have a gas stove. I used to have electric, but I didn't know about this, and I switched to gas, you know, a few years ago, but now I'm thinking, well, that's not efficient to so switch electric. And I'm not sure even if our heater, you know, that's not very efficient and all that. So is that what you were saying? Somebody could come over and assess your home? Yeah, I, I believe we 
it's a virtual assessment, Bonnie, but we do offer home energy assessments and I can send you that information offline. But great, great to hear that you're considering a, it sounds like an induction stovetop in the future. That's really cool. Well, we did get- um... On the, on the upside, we have solar installed and Bonnie has an all electric vehicle. Very nice. I, really, I was motivated. I, I've been attending a lot of these meetings since, you know, um, 2002. And um, so we had the solar panels put on in 2019. And then right after that, we just bought a um, Kia electric car. Highly, re highly recommended, <laughs> highly recommended. And our PG&E bill is between $9 and $15 per bill. That's great. Very nice. Yeah. Rick, did you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm wondering how the electrons in PG&E's wires know whether the energy that's pushing them back and forth came from a green or a brown source. Um, the, the difference between the, the, the light and the dark green uh, that you showed us, 60% versus 100%, uh, sounds great in principle, but the, the electrons is fungible the electrons are fungible so um how it's not like pulling into costco and deciding whether you want the super gasoline or the regular i mean it's different tanks but all the electrons are coming from the same place try to explain that to me sure yeah no i think the way that i think about it rick is you know if you're a cca customer you're ensuring that the electricity that's procured on your behalf that's put onto the shared grid is coming from renewable sources, right? Like the commodity of electricity itself wouldn't really work if we were taking so many poles and wires directly from the generation source to your home or business, like there would be far too much infrastructure, right? So it's, I think it's, it's more so about ensuring that the power that you as an individual are putting onto the grid is renewable. Um, but you're right, you know, it's, it's, it, you can't really differentiate between the electrons that um, are coming from PG&E or, or MCE. Hopefully that makes sense. So uh, this is Paul. Uh, Sebastian, can maybe get a feel? I know I, I, I hate to be uh, uh, biased about uh, California's actions. And uh, you know, it seems to me that we've been leading the path for a long way and there are other Western states that are following and, and in fact, provinces from Canada. Um, but you know what? Is, how, really, how are we doing? I mean, I do I do all fly and I buy these carbon you know, offsets, and and the fact is, it it doesn't do much other than make me feel good. Um, so how are we, how really are we doing with all these efforts to to provide clean energy? What's your, what's your personal assessment, Ola? Yeah, I mean, we certainly have the most robust CCA network of any state, right? And I think that. Um, in California, we're kind of leading the charge and setting the gold standard for what CCAs can do and hopefully provide kind of that modeling for other states that are considering community choice aggregation. Um, yeah, you know, and I'll also say that there's there's been some pretty aggressive policies stated at a state level. I know we're trying to um, ensure that, I believe it's by 2030, no um, diesel cars uh, can be purchased like for new vehicles and also like really like incentivizing battery storage as well, I think is super important. You know, there's a lot of really great rebates and incentives for folks um, like Bonnie that have solar on their homes to go out and, and get a battery and be more self-sustaining in that regard. So um, I think it's a combination of, you know, um, at a local level, you know, ensuring that CCAs are, are robust and then also setting policies at a state level um, that help encourage um, kind of the adoption of new technologies like EVs and batteries. Great, thank you. This is Felicia. I was wondering if I could just add to, to that real quick, um, Sebastian and Paul, you know, that the, the more distributed, more networked, more local, like all of those things kind of go back to Sue, your question earlier in terms of, you know, how do we actually really make change? And so the pictures you showed Sebastian of local installations that then feed into the larger grid like that's the direction that we <laughs> we definitely need to be going and so and then when when I had answered Sue's question earlier about the question of purpose you know CCA community choice aggregation that change that's an example of changing the purpose from 
uh, maximizing shareholder value to um, putting the, the consumer and in this case, uh, having an alternative to conventional fuels uh, as, as the foremost sort of direction. And of course they still have to be financially solvent, but it's not maximizing shareholder value that is the, the guide star for the entire operation. It becomes quite different. And, and you can translate that to any number of other industries, um, as I was alluding to earlier, like with regard to where your money is in terms of your bank, like, is it local? Are they financing local projects? Or is it huge and they're financing these big, giant, <laughs> not local projects? Yeah, no, Felicia, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, CCAs are public not-for-profit agencies. We have a board made up of local elected officials that make policy decisions on our, our behalf. Um, and I believe, at least at MCE, 90% of our, um, our our money actually goes back into power purchasing, right? So there's there's no shareholders, as you're alluding to, um, which I think is a real value out of the CCA model as well. Anybody else have any questions? No, just, uh, I, I'd like to follow up on the conversation about um, distributed versus networked um, energy. So, uh, um, it's, it's recovered a little bit, but really there's the, the two concepts. One is, you know, in industrialized countries, particularly we have these, uh, these big networks um, uh, where we share energy and uh, uh, it can, you know, can go across states and um, the, uh, the European Union's developing this network. So they, they can share resources and one goes up and one comes down um, that, that they, you know, they don't fail. Um, and the other concept is that one is where you develop the energy at the source of the use. Um, so, for example, there's a big movement called the uh, Distributed Renewable Energy, DRE, uh, which is a solution to some of the problems uh, that uh, Felicia and Moise has talked about. Um, uh, he comes from Nigeria, which is an energy-rich country, uh, but you every six or eight months or so you hear a story about uh, five to 25 uh, people killed when someone broke open a uh, oil um, gas line to get some uh, fuel and it set off a big explosion or a fire um, because uh, most of the people don't have access to it. So the solution is um, you know, sort of tiered solution of getting energy out to people who, who can use it uh, and uh, solar is one solution, uh, but replacing uh, what a lot of folks use, which is kerosene, which is deadly. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what do you? What's your take on what the solution is, uh, Sebastian, for uh, the for the for, for California and the U.S.? What is, what is the solution that works um, works best, and what, and how do the how does it network and the distributed system? How do they work together? Over. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for battery storage, right? I think a lot of the problems that you're describing, Paul, could be solved with that, particularly as it relates to, like you've seen this summer and um, and last year as well, like the independent system operator who oversees the grid of California, like calling for what we call flex alerts. You've probably seen some of that messaging, right? Um, just saying that, you know, because people are cranking up their ACs, it's really hot out. Um, the grid can't handle all of that, you know, all of that demand. And so batteries, like being able to utilize all of the solar that we have on our grid and storing that for those times is, is super important. So I think as much as we can incentivize, you know, um, both residential battery storage and larger scale storage throughout the state um, can really help from uh, a DER perspective, distributed energy resource perspective. Sorry to use acronyms. I think there's some, thank you. I think someone else had uh, had a question there. Hey, Annette. Marsha, no. I see Annette's hand raised. Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Annette. Uh, just make sure to unmute. Just make sure to unmute. Hi, Jace. 
And then we can't hear you. You have to unmute. Uh, well, well, uh, my PJ, while she works on that, maybe there's somebody else. Uh, Marsha, you're, you're uh, did you have a question or a statement? Okay. Yeah. Annette, okay. how were you able to, you think you can locate that unmute button? Can't find it? Lower left. <laughs> Lower left, Annette. Can't hear, Can't hear you. <laughs> or hold the space bar down. Oh. Yeah, hold the space, space bar down. There you go. Yeah, that might work too. Try holding your space bar down. Hold it. <laughs> Dang it. Unfortunately, as the host, I'm not able to unmute you, Annette. I tried. <laughs> Maybe they could present their, their comment or question in the chat. Yeah, Annette, uh, you think you could type that into the chat? Do I not know what that means? Very nice idea, Aww. by the way. Thank you. I have a question in the meantime. So, um, Sebastian, so if um, transportation is the major um, greenhouse gas um, a percentage. What what is number two then, and is there anything we can control in our day 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 living? Sure. Yeah. It's a uh, number two is actually in the state of California, um, the industrial sector. So, not a whole lot that you can do on an individual level. Um, I would say, other than just like engaging with your local CCAs and elected officials and, you know, keeping abreast of some of the key issues that impact that sector. Um, but yeah, I mean, transportation, number one, um, the ag sector represents about 8%, so not a huge amount, but yeah, electricity comes in at number three. Sebastian, I have a question. Um, how are we um, encouraging the next generation of youth uh, to get involved in this field and uh, awareness about energy, clean energy? Um, there's the California Education and Environmental Initiative that's in the schools that is, um, has an effect on the curriculum that's being taught K-12. But I'm wondering how else youth are being encouraged to get involved. Yeah, great question. I, I don't think there's really any shortage of avenues for youth to get involved. Like we're seeing this new generation be particularly interested in climate activism, which is great. Um, I know in Marin, there are a number of, um, a, a lot of our cities in Marin and our towns in Marin have um, like climate action committees. I know Fairfax does, um, San Anselmo does, Corner Madera does. I know on a number of those committees, there's youth commissioners, like high school, high school students that actually serve and make recommendations to the city council and town council, which is really great. Um, from like a curriculum standpoint, I know at MCE, at least we partner with Marin School of Environmental Leadership, um, which does, you know, climate education and programming at Terra Linda High School. So like integrating it with, with the schools. Um, and then I think a lot of the CCAs across the state are really engaged on youth engagement as well. I know at MCE, we did a program for Earth Day earlier this year called Because of Youth, where we really just highlighted and amplified youth voices across our social media and blog and newsletters and things of that sort. So just like giving visibility to these kids that um, you know care so much about these issues. Thank you. Did you say that you were connected with the environmental, um, the with Terra Linda High? There is an environmental um, offshoot of that high school. Was that what you were saying? Yeah, there's there's a program called School of Environmental Leadership at right. Terra Linda that we we partner with for for many years. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I had a question. 
Uh, has geothermal energy been considered in this discussion? I know yeah. uh, some relatives of my wife's in uh, Minnesota and the agricultural community are making good use of geothermal energy, at least for her eating purposes. Yeah, no, great question, Frank. I know geothermal makes up a small percentage of MCE's portfolio. I want to say, and don't quote me on this, but off the top of my head, I want to say it's like two or three percent of our standard. You know, most of our power comes from solar and wind and large hydroelectric, but yeah, there is a small percentage of geothermal as well. This is Rick in Sonoma. We have, we're very lucky here. We have the geysers, an awful lot of energy, geothermal energy comes from the power plant up there. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Wanted to make two comments. Maybe, um, maybe you can expand your program in the schools because schools can initiate the programs, the youth-led programs. And um, I know that that's been done everywhere. The UN in, um, in New York and the UNAs throughout the country, the UN has a huge number of youth programs. In fact, almost, I would say 90% of what they're doing is, is youth focused and future and progressive. And I just wanted to add that it looks like Annette has unmuted herself. So she had something to say. Yeah, she's frozen. Oh, no, she's not frozen. <laughs> nope. Annette, we can hear you. You can ask your question now if you'd like to. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. It's just a little question about my PG&E bill. Um, you said that PG&E charge for the delivery of MCE electricity. But in here, it says, your charges on this page are separated into delivery charges from PG&E and generation of, uh, generation of procurement charges from the energy provided. These two charges are for different services and are not duplicate charges. You also said that PG&E charges for the, so why is MCE delivery charges as well as PG&E? Told yeah. you it was little. Yeah, no, great, great question. And, and billing can be pretty confusing. A lot of folks, um, you know, ask us like, oh, I didn't get my MCE bill. It's like, oh, cool, because it still comes from PG&E, right? Um, but, and to your question, PG&E is still billing you for that delivery service, like the maintenance of the infrastructure and actually getting the power from the grid to your home, that's the delivery charge and that comes from PG&E. So MCE doesn't have any, any business there. We just do the generation. So the generation charge that you would see on your bill is the MCE power procurement. So it, it is two different charges, um, one from PG&E and one from MCE. So if I went 100% MCE, I still have one charge? You would, yeah. It would be a little bit charges. more expensive. You would have one, the same one charge on generation. Um, it would be a little bit more expensive per month, about $5 for the average customer. That doesn't um, matter. Yeah, but it would be still one, one generation charge. That's right. Oh, very much for your time. Yeah, of Rick, course. I'm seeing you have a question. Rick, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. I actually have a question for you, PJ. Oh. You, said, um, you're, you yeah. said you're 18. Yes, I am. Right, old 18. Well, if you reverse the digits, you'll get my age, which means you've got about 63 years more ahead of you than I do. <laughs> uh, it means I'm 63 years in experience behind you. Yeah. Um, it's great to see you here, um, but um, what about, what can you say of anything about the rest of your generation? I mean, it, it, it's not just you, but all, all of the people who are now about graduating from high school and entering college um, should be worried to hell about this. Uh, uh, you're gonna face a lot more serious climate change than I've seen in my lifetime. Any, any comments on, on, on I know you can't speak for the whole 
generation of 18 year olds, but maybe you have some impressions about where your uh, contemporaries are at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's uh, the thing about my generation is it's very multifaceted and that you can find a lot of different types of people. Um, I would like to say that at, at least for my generation, it's a, it's a very climate conscious um, people because it's exactly as Sebastian was saying, um, and as you were saying, it's it's all kind of connected, uh, and that that is something that I think we can uniquely act for because climate change and and clean energy is something that we you know can see the the real effect of um, over the next I don't know how many years. Um, but to be honest, it's um, it's still ramping up. I, I think I would love to see more. I always like to see more of, of youth, um, both engaged in, in public policy as well as involved in climate action. Uh, we've had some climate marches recently, which I've been a big fan of. Well, when I say recently, I mean within the last few years. Um, but I, I think it's I think it's the matter of having more meetings like these where we're having more education and we're having more, you know, outreach and we're we're really learning about what this is, how to access it and you know, what it all means. Because I, I told Sebastian when we were um, sort of kind of planning this event initially that I have limited experience, you know, I know the basics and and um, I've researched the specific fields that I'm knowledgeable with but I said I wanted to have him just even go over the basics because you know I've had friends ask me I, I said hey we're doing a you know clean energy event with you and Amarin and then my friends go what is clean energy though like what is that what is a greenhouse gas um so that's exactly why why we are you know having this meeting and and why SCG7 is so important it's because it's about bringing attention to these uh important topics if that sort of answers your question. You know, that shows the need, the necessity for having these presentations available in the in the schools themselves. Is that happening yet? Or are you working toward that? Well, um, I have no interest in going back to my high school and telling you about clean. No, I, I'm just I, kidding. That's a joke. I actually wouldn't be happy to go back. For more people who are actually so doing the work, well. but thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to bring Sebastian by my old high school, teach him a little bit about clean energy. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. No, Sue, yeah. I would, I would say, uh, candidly, it's it's been a little limited to this point to have like in-person conversations with students. Um, I've been at MCE two years now, a majority of which has been in a pandemic setting, so there's not hasn't really been that opportunity for in-person events. But you know, we're always looking to expand upon our youth engagement efforts, and I think if that means meeting with students where they're at, um, that's something we can definitely consider. I think you might also check with science uh, departments, civics, doing Zooms, audio, you know, we, they, whenever, you know, they can be in the classrooms is great, but right now, you know, Zoom presentations like this should be regularly done in schools all over Marin and the counties that you're in, and that will set the standard for moving forward, I do believe. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Deanna, I see you have a question. Yeah, hi, thank you for the presentation. I just, um wanted to say that I have a son that's 17 and he is in the MSL program at Terra Linda and he was listening for a little bit, but went to go do some homework. Um, but I um, have been talking up just UN membership to some of the other parents in MSL and they don't seem to even know that it exists. And so um, in addition to, and they do have a requirement to do seminars um, and certain volunteer hours that are specific to sustainability. And so, I think it's just an opportunity for this chapter to um, reach out to, um, and I can even put you in touch with them, but to reach out to MCEL um, as well as other programs, because I think that they're expanding also um, and kind of sell the UN chapter in Marin because there's so much valuable information that I think all the students can learn from. So, I mean, I've only, I just joined um, a couple months ago, sorry for the noise in the back, but um, um, my kids have been on the presentations and are listening to them and they both, the two that we've gone to have been really great. And so I think all the kids could really learn a lot from it. Um, 
And the other thing is, is that I just think that the youth, because my daughter's in uh, middle school and the youth just have this awareness <laughs> that the adults don't have. Um, we watched um, a documentary, uh, my daughter and my mother, and it was just interesting to see how my daughter's teaching my mother <laughs> about sustainability and stuff. So I just think that they have a general awareness and even, um, and it could be more so because we're in California, but they think it will, like you said, take time to shift, but that just the fact that they're aware and there are so many um, folks that didn't grow up with that awareness that over time it will shift and people will um, make better choices. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's my hope that eventually a lot of people my age, you know, can go up to their parents and say, hey, you know, what are we doing? Can we get some solar panels? Can we get an electric car for the family? Can we, you know, get into MCE? You know, all these different things that you can bring up because I feel like that's something that parents don't really think about. Like, what can my child teach me? Uh, yeah. Also, I only so got I, an electric car for that reason, too, <laughs> because my son's like, okay, we're going to get a car and this is the what we're going to get. So I think that the kids are, the kids are really aware. And so they are not only pushing the parents, but the parents and the grandparents and others. So I think it's great. Sorry. Sorry, Sebastian. No, you're, you're good, Deanna. I was, I was going to add to that point that you were making, actually, like we at MCE, we're in the, the pretty early stages of this, but I think I can share with you all. We're, we're developing a, a youth engagement toolkit that's um, really will give youth advocates kind of the tools that they need to be able to speak to their peers and their parents about some of the issues that are important to them. You know, we uh, we had developed several years back a, a deep green advocates toolkit. You know, a lot of times when I meet with with groups like you all, um, they're interested in, in increasing deep green adoption um, amongst their, their friends and family. And so it's a toolkit that gives them the tools to talk about deep green, uh, includes like social media collateral and things of that sort. So we kind of took that framework and said, hey, can we, can we develop something in this same vein specifically for youth engagement purposes? And so we're hoping to have that available in, in the coming months as well. And just a suggestion, Sebastian, if you guys haven't already to include youth in the development of that. Yeah, we, we, we certainly are doing that, Felicia. Thank you for the comment. And I thanks. Agree. And Deanna, I just wanted to mention, we will be in touch because we would love to connect with the, um, the program you mentioned. And Bonnie is our membership chair. So you might be hearing from Bonnie Hunter. And, 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 and also please connect uh, or at least check out with the UN. You're working on the sustainable development goals. And part of what your work involves is community you know, alliance with on, on the behalf of the, the global community that the UN is doing on the local level. There's, there's so much information available there. I'd be happy to put you in touch. Uh, again, Bonnie can arrange that if you want, but I highly recommend that if you're preparing a student, you know, handout and a kit, make it, make it really a high level quality thing. And that might be, give you some good help. Thank you, Zoo. Uh, I can put my, um, my email in the chat here just so that y'all have it. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Hellman, I, I believe I saw you have a question earlier, but she's not here anymore. That is so sad. Um, sorry about that. I, um, I have another question. Sure. Um, for Sebastian, what, um, what is the future of hybrids? I mean, if we're trying to pass laws, to not use fuel anymore, petrol-based fuels, and this is 2021. Um, will hybrids just get grandfathered in? Will do we want to jump over hybrids and just go completely for electric vehicles? Uh, I, I'm in the market for a new car, and I'm I'm afraid of buying a hybrid <laughs> because I don't want to invest in anything that uses fuel, uh, petrol-based fuel. So I'm just wondering, what are the plans for hybrids? Because it's becoming a pretty big market now. 
Yeah, well, I would say a hybrid is certainly better than a new internal combustion engine. So if you're considering a hybrid, I think that's that's better than a gasoline based car. Um, in terms of how hybrids fit into kind of the state's goals and kind of how we're thinking about the future of electric vehicles, I don't totally know. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm happy to research more and get back to you with kind of our team here, Ro. Um, but I mean, I would I would certainly advocate for electric vehicle all the way. Like we're, you know, we're seeing more and more charging stations pop up uh, in our communities. Um, you know, it's I think it's a matter of making sure that charging is accessible so people feel comfortable buying an EV and making sure that, um, you know, CCAs and the utilities alike are encouraging um, rates for customers that allow for easy charging at their homes. Um, I think that'll come in time. And I think that we're also seeing a lot of different car manufacturers offering EVs. You know, only a, a couple of years ago, there was really only a handful of electric vehicles available, but they're becoming more and more commonplace across kind of the market. Um, so I'm, I'm obviously a big advocate for the electric vehicle front, but I'm happy to pull some more info about um, about hybrids and kind of how that fits into overall state EV goals too, if that would be helpful. Uh, Sebastian and Ro, I mentioned uh, Bonnie's uh, electric car, and I, I just once have to give a big uh, high sign to how great that car is. Um, we have the uh, plug-in right in the garage. And you, if you don't have a garage, you can still have it. And if you don't have one specifically for your car, uh, you can use the plug-in for your, for your dryer, your laundry dryer. But uh, on a single charge, we get over 290 miles. And that lasts a very long time, 10 days to two weeks, yeah. So anyhow, love it. Oh, and it's also the most fun car you'll ever have to drive because there's no buildup on power. The minute you touch the accelerator, you have 100% of the power. And it's ultra quiet and smooth. <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds like you need a an an advertising deal with Kia. <laughs> the two of you guys. I'd be glad to make some some side income there. Um, glad to be. Yeah, I mean, like to your point about the the two hundred and ninety miles per per charge, um, and you you very rarely would ever need that much. Um, I kind of think about, and this is my own personal opinion, but just like EV charging is kind of like charging your cell phone. Like, how often are you really charging your phone to one hundred percent? Probably not all the time. Like, I'll notice. Okay, my phone's at. 25% should probably charge up to like 75, you know, and just make sure you get to that level. So yeah, I mean, like, it's pretty rare that you would need that full 290 miles, you know, you're running errands across town, you could probably charge it for an hour or so and be good. Full disclosure, though, I, I do have a, a gasoline powered car as a fallback. <laughs> well, I know a lot of a lot of organizations will recommend that like, you know, um, you don't have to have two EV cars. Like it's okay to have another gas powered one. Just like make sure that when that vehicle is at a point when it needs to be retired, like consider purchasing an EV too. Great. Well, uh, uh, I think PJ is about to tell us uh, that we need to to wrap up uh, and move to the final segment. Uh, so uh, oh, I'd like Steve. to thank, uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and if we could uh, thank uh, Sebastian again. And I'll make a I'll make a statement I think uh, so we can move on, Absolutely. and that statement would be uh, so uh, America reached peak uh, petroleum production in 1970. I was 10 years old. That's how old this country this how long this country has been seized with this issue. The oil embargo was 1973, and some of us remember uh, waiting in line to buy gasoline. You could only buy gasoline every other day. In 1979, a uh, shah of, of Iran fell. And there was a big oil shortage. And then that same year, we had the Three Mile Island nu partial nuclear meltdown. We've had an energy policy every administration for the last 50 years. Uh, so there's nothing new under the sun. We've, we've had this discussion before. The one thing that's different is whether or not we will act on the things that we know to be the reality. Uh, so think about it uh, tonight uh, after when you think about this discussion. Like, okay, what is this? Is a great issue. I got told a lot. What am I going to do? What are, what is the thing I'm going to commit myself to do 
uh, to be part of the change solution. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Paul. Um, always a great perspective from those from that wizened beard of yours. <laughs> um, all righty. Um, thank you so much, Sebastian. Really great answers to all the questions and a, a really fantastic presentation. Um, you really taught us all a lot. You have at least taught me a lot. And uh, I have a really a lot to think about. Um, and so while I think about that and, and marinate with all the concepts that we've learned today, I will pass it along to Felicia, who can talk about our next events and uh, kind of give us a debrief. Felicia? Great. Thank you, PJ. Um, so thank you again, Sebastian, for the um, in-depth presentation. And we really appreciate that. And uh, let's see, I have a short list of items to cover. So future meetings, as I mentioned, we have this upcoming uh, United Nations Association Western Region Climate Forum. And this is, um, let's see, it's called Feeling the Heat Expectations for United Nations, the United Nations 26th Climate Conference or COP26. You might've heard that being bandied about. And um, Path to Success and Priorities for Comprehensive Actions. I've just put the URL once again in the chat if you're interested to register for that. That is again, October 1st, and it is from 1.30 to 5. And let's see, the second thing I wanna mention is, as you know, this is our Sustainable Development Goal series, and this was number seven, SDG seven. So we're working up to SDG number eight, Decent Work and Economic Growth which is scheduled for Saturday, November 13th, 3 to 4.30. And I just want to say you're welcome if you're interested in helping to put on these events, to contribute to the brainstorming, to contribute to the speaker selection, uh, marketing, etc. You're welcome to join, uh, first of all, join the United Nations Association and sign up with the Marin County chapter. And Bonnie, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask if you could put our website's um, URL in the chat. Um, unamarin.org, and I'll just say it out loud as well. And, and we are always looking for people to join the board. And the only prerequisite is that you become a member of the United Nations Association. And so the way that works is you pay about $50 a year, if I remember correctly. And the first year is $25. If you're 25 or younger, it's free. And once you're a member, then you can join our board, or even if you don't wanna join the board, but you'd like to participate in this SDG uh, event planning committee, you're certainly welcome to do that. And you can reply to any of our newsletters or uh, send a message to Bonnie, our membership chair, to get involved. And let's see, our, also I'll mention that for our November 13th Decent Work and Economic Growth event, we have, um, I've received a confirmation email back. I haven't double, double confirmed, but I believe we have a speaker from Marine Community Foundation uh, from, the, from the local perspective. So let's see, anything else I need to cover? I think I covered everything. Feel free to let me know if I forgot something. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Okay, great. And let me just add one more plug too for uh, the whole solar panel thing. Um, I just want to say that as pg e has done the safety shutoffs in the recent years, um, we've been able to plug our solar panels uh, into our fridge and keep our fridge going and the freezer going even when the power is out. So that's a handy thing if you're considering actually getting solar. And thank you everybody for spending part of your Sunday with us and stay in touch. Let us know if you have questions, follow up, uh, errors to anything we, we misquoted or whatever. We're happy to hear from you. And this recording will be posted online. You'll be able to find it at unamarin.org. And I believe that's all. Thank you everybody, everybody. so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Sebastian and Felicia, again, for the wonderful presentation. Thank yeah, you. great. And thank you, PJ and Sebastian, both doing stellar work there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, See you next time. Okay. Have a great Sunday. Thank you. Take care.